this right from the beginning why the book uh, i think that question is best put to left word so danga is here vijay is not here but it was left word that actually persuaded me to write it journalist i am i also am journalist first activist later not too used to talking about myself and writing about myself it was very difficult they actually wrote to me soon after the cbi raids in uh, july 2015 but i only started working on it in april 2016 they felt it was important that the story be told this way so if we go back to the beginning of the story i think a lot of people are aware of your background but i would still lead you right from the beginning you became a journalist you come from a family with a distinguished legal heritage why a journalist tried as it sounds it was standard 7 and all the president's men and this little paper bag that my father brought me from strand book stall and i just finished it in 3 nights and uh, I somehow I always had this feeling that of the two sisters, there are two sisters. Of the two sisters, I would be the one who does law, not her. And I just then remember having long discussions with my dad and saying, "Sorry, it's not going to be law anymore. I'm going to do journalism." And I was very lucky. I always had a father who encouraged discussion, debate, arguments. And he didn't once tell me, you know, come back to the family pesha because it would have been much easier doing law. One would have been a mainstream lawyer, whether one was good or bad. Uh, but uh, Yeah, it was journalism from the beginning. After that, <laughs> considering the amount of time you've spent in law courts, do you regret that choice? <laughs> Not doing law. <laughs> Not doing. <laughs> well, uh, my lawyers are also going to be here. I think up by now, she'll come. Uh, but uh, I don't think so because uh, some training was there. I did two years and then I dropped out without taking my sanat. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have the best in the field. Uh, but you know, ironically, the lawyers who stood by us for 15 years are not the family names. I've said this in my book. Yes. The, the lawyers who stood by for the long haul have been lawyers who are first generation, who made it on their own, and who are committed to the ideals of the law. They are not the big names in law. So, so I think uh, that's a very important lesson for me that those, whether it's Meher Desai, whether it's Aparna Bhatt, whether it's Kamini Jaiswal, I mean, Prashant is an exception. But otherwise, it's people who actually build. you know they've really been the first people to get into law in their in their families so they would tell you i think that the drafts i prepare uh, i write i do the drafting and then they do the sobering down because for me it's <laughs> for me it's important that everything is put on record for them it's important to negotiate a very conservative system uh, so the balance is then struck so you start as a journalist in the mid 80s 84 early 80s and 82. early 80s and very early on in your career you run into communal violence yeah. would you just tell us yeah it, uh, you know i i said that that you know 84 what happened in delhi of course is a national shame and memory as it should be but but for us in western india maharashtra bombay and bhiwandi burned very very badly in 84 may of 84 and that was my first occasion to cover uh, communal violence uh, for, for the delhi and uh, javed covered it for bhiwan javed covered bhiwandi and uh, that that it was a, f- the difference between 84 and 92 93 was very stark because in 92 93 class was breached so you didn't have the uh, east in west bombay, yeah talking. in bombay post babri yeah. you didn't have the east west divide in 84 everything was happening east of the railway track so western part of bombay almost didn't know what was happening so for many of us it was a task to tell that part of bombay how the rest of bombay was burning and it was the shift in that turning to hindutva it was all the symptoms that we see in the in communal violence were there and that was really open my eyes to how communal violence should be covered what are the do's and don'ts for a reporter sure. and because later you <coughs> make this point and it's an important point that uh, journalism after reporting on incidents as they happen often doesn't display long term interest in following up what is happening uh in your experience between 84 and 92 93 did you return to the story or there were other stories you started doing this it is a realization that came later that's what i no i think the realization grew it didn't happen it was not immediate it was certainly uh, hit me by hit us both by 93 but i remember 84 85 86 was such a crucial period uh, for many of us in india uh, we were seeing on the streets the outbreak of majoritarian communalism you know advani's rath yatra riots before and after where the rath yatra went and shabano you know it was literally that majority minority communalism playing into each other i remember attending so many uh, public meetings in mamadali road vivandi area where 
very very volatile things were being said about the Shah Banu uh, judgment and there were problems in the language of that judgment as Chandratur himself uh, admitted later that I should not have commented on the Quran, I should not have talked about everything. But you know the nature was that you know maintenance for a Muslim woman and then you suddenly ask for a special law and uh, the same government that opened the talas of Babri Masjid conceded and gave that divorce protection act. So at one stroke, you're feeding majority and minority communalism. And uh, that was, again, a throwback to partition sure. and what happened uh, pre-partition, where the Muslim League story we know, but the RSS and Hindu Mahasabha story is not told by us often enough because we've not internalized it. So we seem to be repeating some of these uh, huge historical errors with greater and greater intensity. Now, I guess there was a pattern already to this, the 84 campaign itself by the Congress was a campaign one on majoritarian communalism. It was just a different minority that was the target of that campaign. Uh, and I think that's a lesson maybe every other political party in the country picked up, including the Shiv Sena, which had already perfected it in different ways. So when in 92, 93, you are still a reporter and you compare 84, 92, 93, <coughs> What hit you? What were the changes in your own outlook towards these situations? You know, by uh, between 83 and 93, I'd done daily in Indian Express and then Business India. And you found suddenly that the media is not linking up these trends that we are talking about today. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the very uh, important point you made, I've said this in the book as well, that 84, this city burned, Delhi, after 31st of December when you had Indira Gandhi's assassination. And first to third, we saw the anti-Sikh pogrom, brutal pogrom, and the PUCL little book, I, you know, sure. we all have that book, Who Are the Guilty? And the Congress persons named in that book, you know, who never, of course, got their just desserts legally. Uh, but the election that was held in December, and I remember the campaign, it was a sure. very, very histrionic, nationalistic campaign. But what struck me was that the guys named in that report, all three or four of them, were given tickets by Rajiv Gandhi's uh, campaign and the city of Delhi voted them in. It's not just the political party giving it, but all of us who give votes in the name of that majoritarianism. And like you said, the Sikh minority was the target. So that happened in Delhi. Then in Bombay 93, Madhukar Sarpodar, in my constituency where I live, Juhu, he swept, uh, I mean, he was responsible in Rampada, Kherwadi for the violence. He's given a ticket, he wins. So Modi winning in 2002, 2012, is just a logical extension of that same politics. And if we go back, much of this was already playing out in Gujarat from the caste change from the caste to communal violence at that point of time. If I'm not mistaken, Modi was actually involved at that time in some of the politics. Yeah, he was. I mean, I've not really documented it very minutely, so I wouldn't like to comment. But uh, I, there's one anecdote about his emergency era politics when he was hiding from the authorities. But, but he was involved in then. And it was very easy in Gujarat to convert the anti-caste thing to an anti-communal thing. And it happened twice or thrice over. Sure. In 92-93 is the one rare example I wanted to just ask because that's only that's not there in the book. But it is the one example where a judge actually managed to sit and prepare a report that we can pay attention. Did you cover that aspect as a reporter? Why was <laughs> that different? Was it the personality of a person? What made it so unique in our own? You know, uh, Hartosh, actually, uh, after 1993, one of the things I did was to look at all the commission reports sure. of the uh, post-partition communal violence. And Justice Shri Krishna was a rare example, but not the only example. You had the Jagmohan Reddy Commission report sure. of 69. You have the uh, Vidyatil Commission report of Delhi Cheri. You have the Ranchi Commission, Ran Ranchi Violence report. And in fact, Judicial Commission reports of sitting judges and retired judges have been exemplary, right up to Vadva. It was the Vadva Commission on the Stains uh, massacre that completely went awry because of the regime in power. But the problem is that the Judicial Commission rec reports pinned responsibility. But the justice process did the opposite. The justice process did not punish the guilty. So I have now started looking at the whole question of why, don't, why do we have an absence of institutional memory in this country? Surely if your Judicial Commission reports are telling you that a certain kind of right-wing propaganda is perpetuating hate speech before the first stone is cast and the police is behaving in a partisan fashion. You know, Sri Krishna said it, but also Vidya Til said it, also the Ranchi Commission said it. 1969, I mean, the Bath said it, the Jagmohan Reddy Commission. But the courts have not in internalized this in terms of delivering of justice. So I don't know, this, it is this dichotomy that we need to address. 
And somewhere during this period, you make the switch from being a reporter to focusing exclusively on what is, after all, the most important problem this country faces, communalism. Yeah. How did that happen? What yeah, it was one of those choices. I mean, I was Bombay Union of Journalists. You talk about we were talking about the Working Journalists Act, so we were trying to tell journalists not to sign the contract and be working journalists, be with the Federation of Working Journalists. I was we formed the Women and Media Com Committee with senior women journalists to look at portrait. So feminism, labor, all of these were priorities. And suddenly, after the same period, eighty-six onwards, one felt that communalism is what one should be concentrating on and uh, deepening one's understanding of. So that came out of this 86 to uh, 92, 93 period of experiencing what India was. But towards, say, early 2000s, one is suddenly getting the feeling that just doing communism is not going to work. You have to look at neoliberalism. You have to look at the effect of the neoliberal politics and how it is fragmenting resistance. So uh, there's been a lot of rethinking on that as well. Then there are these series of reports in the <coughs> early 2000s leading up to 2002 where over and over again, you write in caution that something major is in the offing. The state is headed toward disaster. Yeah, that uh, I mean, that is for anybody who thinks that one obsession is with one individual. One should read those issues of combat because right from 1991, I've been tracking Gujarat. People say, why? Maybe because my family came from there. I don't know what it is, but I've been looking at Gujarat very carefully. 1991, I did it for Business India. Then for combat, five cover stories on the developments in Gujarat. And a feeling that state and uh, societal organizations, whether it's the Bar Council, whether it's the teachers' organization, are all being completely taken, taken over by proto-fascist forces that don't believe in the Constitution. So the feeling that something, you had selective censuses of Christians, the selective censuses of Muslims taking place. You had the Gujarat police saying that inter-community marriages of anybody, even if they're above 18, will be criminally investigated. Every step was anti-constitutional. I remember coming to Mr. Fali Nariman. I remember coming to Justice Varma I know you've written with documents saying, please, let's file a preemptive thing about what's happening in Gujarat. Uh, so we were talking about, you come to Delhi with some of the evidence. You actually talk to Fali Nariman. You go to the NHRC. Uh, do you feel that things could have turned a little differently at that point of time? You know, our courts only respond after disasters happen. One sure. talks about the media, and I just felt if something preemptive were possible. Yeah, but everybody said, document it. We can't do anything now. Document it. We can't. We kept documenting it, but uh, then 2002 happened. Sure. Can you just sort of describe some of that documentation? Because I think a lot of people tend to think of 2002 as this strange singularity, the whole history of communalism on the years just leading up to that. You know, I remember these circulars coming out, the circulars being brought out by the Ahmedabad Collectorate, Baroda Collectorate, State Home Department, selective censuses census of Christians in Gujarat, selective censuses of Muslims in Gujarat. Now, this is nothing short of building up data to enable targeting tomorrow, you know, I mean, if, I mean to put it very crudely and to put it more uh, in a slightly distinct way, it is anti constitutional because your, your data cannot be targeting one section. And we would like to, I mean, we, we know that in 2002 some of these lists were used, etc. So that was some kind of documentation. Apart from that, you had incredible amount of hate speech being generated through pamphlets over a period of time. Uh, those were not as far back as 2001, uh, sorry, as 1998 onwards, not as far back as. You had hate speech being circulated in their lakhs and thousands, where the singular thing was how Muslim women should be treated in times of conflict, which is rape. Some of them had official VHP stamps with addresses on them, which enables prosecution under the law, but no steps were taken. I remember in 1998, August, September, PUCL of Gujarat, uh, my good friends Rohit Prajapati and Trupti Shah, Trupti unfortunately is no more with us, they did this wonderful report on, uh, you know, for, for almost three weeks, Muslims of Randikpur and Sanjayi. It's the same village where Bilkis Banu was then gang raped in 2000. In Panchmahas. For three weeks, Muslims had to stay out of their villages, out of seven villages, because the VHP had decided to take over the motor businesses in the area. And it was a full fledged documented report of PUCL, which Communism Combat showcased on the cover. Babu Bajrangi was by then running his Patel racket, which is kidnapping every Patel girl who decided to marry a non Patel. And the same Babu Bajrangi then becomes accused of Naroda Patia. 
So all this is there, you know, and Babu Bajrangi, I mean, these Patel girls are 21 year old, 22 year old, college going professionals. They choose to marry either a non-Patel Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. And he kidnaps them back, coerces them, coerces the family. We filed petitions on this in the Bombay High Court, along with their husbands, no judicial uh, remedy. So, you know, uh, somehow our system needs to address this fact is when anti-constitutionalism at the core of certain activities, why is our system institution not able to arrest it? And you were in Bombay when you got the call about Godra. Yeah. And uh, did you immediately head off to Gujarat? Was no, it a I, I went four days later, but uh, it, was, it was a Wednesday. I still remember it was Wednesday and it was crazy because um, I, I, only thing I tried, my mobile number was the same, but Mobiles were very expensive those days. I kept keep thinking 22 rupees a minute or something. And uh, the calls would just not stop coming from about 9, 30, 10 onwards. And I only got those calls because I had covered Gujarat before. Because I covered Gujarat for almost 10, 15 years. And from every district, every area, 80, 85% were Muslims, but 25% Hindus were calling up. Because everybody was terrified about the kind of build-up. And later on, Thanks to the gentleman in the third row, Mr. R.B. Shri Kumar, former DGP of Gujarat, who is with us, and I'd like to acknowledge him here. Sir. One of the bravest officers I know. Thanks to his affidavit in the Ananavati Commission, everything we were seeing from the outside was being corroborated by SIB reports. So it's not as if only human rights activists and journalists were saying it. The State Intelligence Bureau of Gujarat is warning the Home Department. Home Minister is Modi, warning them that this kind of build-up is happening, please act. But nobody's acting. What was the nature of these calls? Could you just maybe describe what the tone, the urgency, some of it? Oh, it, 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 I mean, it's very chilling, you know. They, 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 were, they, they were, you know, you, in, in, in cities it was like 10,000 mobs. That, that was from 28 onwards. On 27, the calls we are getting is, in every village, the VHP is garnering. RSS Shakas are meeting. Meetings are taking place. And the call is being given to attack. So they're saying, we are going to be attacked. And we are being told that the Muslims of Gujarat will have to pay for Gotra. Gulbar got that call. Sadarpura got that call. Himmatnagar got, I got calls from there. I still remember a journalist colleague. The next day, 28th, when Ahmedabad was attacked. Uh, Alamdur Bukhari, senior journalist from Gujarat today. He's living in this building where the Gujarat right. Today press is and his entire family lives with him. And a 20,000 mob is attacking and making desperate calls from Bombay. Finally, because I just yelled at one SP whom I know, I can't name him now, was in another district. He managed to get to one officer, so the force. They were desperate calls. They were calls which was communicating a sense of fear from 27th onwards. And you were also talking to officials at the same time? All of them. And they became names, the faces later, PC Pandey. Gondia, uh, Tandan, all these names later on in the Zakia Jafri case became people who we now call accused number so and so or whatever. But Jabalia, all these names are the people we were talking to. A.K. Sharma who is now in the CBI, Modi's brought him here, he was uh, SP Masana. All these people we were talking to and saying, please, why are these calls coming to us? And you know the other thing, Hartosh, why were the calls coming outside Gujarat to Bombay? I mean in Baroda, Rohit and Trupti were like a mini control room. But in Ahmedabad, even civil society activists were terrified. They could not step out and act. So it needed an outside intervention. And what was the official response to your calls? Well, they had to take the calls. They would, uh, they would uh, this thing. But for me, that what typifies those days is when on the 2nd of, third, second of March, Nirmala Didi, she's no more, Nirmala Subramanian had given me the numbers of uh, the army officials, the president's uh, Delhi, uh, Arke Narayans, all the secretary and all that. So I kept calling this particular number from the army that was given to him. I didn't have a name to that number. And I kept on saying, Major Saab, Major Saab, ye ho raha, ye ho raha, ye ho raha. And the fifth time I called him, he said, why are you giving me a certain direction in which to go and why is the police telling me the opposite? He yelled back. So I didn't know what to say. So I said, sir, which of the directions are proving to be correct? So there was a 10 second silence and he said, yours are. So then I said, why are you shouting at me? This, if I remember from the book, is Amiruddin, Nasiruddin's brother, in charge of the army there. Uh, which is just a question and aside. 
in each of these operations, this was true in 84, 2002, the army is required to file status reports of operations. These probably sit somewhere in the official records of the Indian government. I thought you should not be asking this question. Uh, Operation Aman was the report that uh, Zamiruddin Shah filed. Uh, I filed an application to the Defense Ministry to get it. Uh, my application is still pending with the Chief Election, uh, Chief, sorry, Chief, CIC, Chief Information Commissioner, Delhi. Uh, Mr. Ramesh Bukhraman, who's here, my, one of my lawyers, he went down to Trivandrum to defend that RTI application. He was, they admitted in front of him that such an operation report is lying with the Defence Ministry, but they cited national security reasons for not giving it up. Operation Aman, if any journalist can get it. Exactly, it's something. And uh, you travel. Because that report, according to me, documents explosively and exposes the lie that uh, the regime has perpetuated that the army was brought in on time. Uh, there were some faxes sent to Delhi, but all the records, again the local records show us, SIB, police control, that army was allowed to operate only after 2nd or 3rd March. Before that it was just patrolling and not allowed to intervene. So all the damage had virtually been done by then. 1926 lives lost post Godra. Four days later, you travel to Gujarat, yeah. and what do you see? What do you find? I first went straight to the Shah Alam camp, and I spent about six, seven hours there. And uh, then I went to all the other camps in Ahmedabad. It was awful. It was a horrifying sight because we saw the camps in Bombay also, 92, 93. And uh, the, one of the things that really struck me was that these are like refugees in their own land. Never before have I felt that the state is not allowing refugee camps to be set up or to exist with dignity. There was a sense of desperation and fear. And even the Chief Secretary Subara, whose number was given to me by Nirmala Devi, we kept telling him, he was abroad at the time, he came, kept telling him that why are relief and supplies not being given to the relief camp? Why is water not being supplied? Why is, you know, why is dignity not being given to the uh, internally displaced? And that was true in all the relief camps. I think Gujarat 2002 is probably, I don't know enough about Delhi, but probably the only time when the community leadership was the only one that set up camps, the state did not set up any, and the state did everything not to give money or help to the internally displaced refugees. And the first petition we filed, CJP, Citizens for Lesson Peace, was to get the state to pay for, the, for, the, for, for whatever, the milk, the water, the tea, the masala that was being given to the refugees. And we had to get Aspi Chinoy, senior lawyer from Bombay, to go and fight that case in Ahmedabad, April 2002. When you enter the court in April 2002, full of Bajrang Dalis, saffron clad, very scary atmosphere. And I remember the two, day before the case, Aspi said, Tisa, I can't go. I'm busy. Uh, I'm sure you're exaggerating. I'm sure you can find a lawyer from the Gujarat High Court. I just said, Aspi, I trust you. Find me a lawyer and you brief him. Don't go tomorrow, because he had a matter in Bombay. He called me back in two hours and he said, I'm sorry, I could not find anybody. I'm going and I'm not charging CJP for the ticket. Because I think nobody could really understand how grave the situation is. Then he had to stand for five hours to convince Justice Majumdar to simply release that minuscule amount of money for the relief camps. And during this period, you were largely traveling alone through the violence? Yeah, yeah. I got the security after 2004. 2004. At what point did you, from documenting and reporting, decide that a legal recourse, you have to intervene yourself in the legal process? I think in the first fortnight or 20 days, because I think the first thing that kept striking uh, me when I would call back home or my colleagues was that if Bombay was bad in 92-93, Gujarat is 1000 times worse. You know? And one had done everything in Bombay, one had written, one had documented, one had participated in the Sri Krishna Commission inquiry, one had testified. Like you said, a very good report had come out. Sabrang had even published that report for 60 rupees and 90 rupees, so it could be read by everybody. And obviously that advocacy was just not enough because the perpetrators were not punished. So I said, maybe, maybe we need to take this to the next level. You know, that Let's just try and see if we can file the cases and whether justice can ever be done. I mean, look at the sick, anti-sick violence. How many perpetrators have been punished? How many? So that was when the journey began. Uh, CJP was formed in April 2002. The first case was the relief camp case. And I, I believe that's the reason for much of the reprisals because I think the government doesn't really care when you have seminars or write papers or articles, however good they may be. 
But if you kind of take them up in the court, and maybe some of your things are proved right, then 172 perpetrators are punished. <laughs> so would you just uh, lead us through the Zahira case? I know a lot has been written, but I think we need reminding of what all has happened right from the beginning, including how the government intervened the best to bakery. change the Best Bakery case. You know, Best Bakery case sort of got the spotlight in July 2003, which is almost a year and three or four months after the genocide carnage. Before that, CJP had filed the case I mentioned on relief camps. We had come to the Supreme Court asking for transfer of investigation in the eight other cases, including Kulberg, Sadarpura, and all that. So it was not the first thing that CJP sure. took up, okay? But between, uh, uh, I think, July 2002 and July 2003, there were acquittals, fast acquittals. Best Bakery, Pandavada, Kiryat, big, big massacres in Kiryat two tempos with 61 Muslims had been burned alive. Pandal rather 24 Muslims massacred. So suddenly you saw a spate of acquittals. And the last such was in uh, June 2003, which was the best bakery acquittal. Now when Justice Varma, the NHRC team, had visited Gujarat, uh, you know, you go around, he had insisted that I go with him to get some of the testimony. So you give your card. So Zaira Sheikh, uh, soon after she, you know, what happened in the acquittals was that the entire Habibullah Sheikh family turned hostile in Baroda. They did not defend their case and they, the trial was over in a, a week. Uh, she then went to her village in UP, Basti area, I think or something. When she comes back, she gives me a call and she says that, you know, I feel very guilty about what I have done and I want to tell you why I did it. I want to tell the world why I did it. And she was only 18, 17 and a half year old girl at that. So we consult lawyers, we ask her to write, her mother writes to us, she writes, sends a fax to CJP, and then she comes to Bombay. When we had that very historic press conference on 7th of July, where she actually narrates in front of the media, and the media was very different then, <laughs> a very, very different media. So uh, she narrates the entire story about how she was pressurized by Madhu Shivasta, a BJP MLA, to, to actually t take back her testimony. I remember Abhishek Kapoor, the Indian Express correspondent uh, from Baroda, he had written the story about how, at the time, contemporaneously, how she was kept under Madhu Shivastav's kabja, why her testimony was on. You know, so all this material helped. After the press conference, uh, we, we bring her to NHRC. By then, Justice Anand is the chair, and uh, she testifies and gives her testimony. And then NHRC decides to file the case for transfer. Uh, CJP files a case along with her after NHRC files. Both the cases are clubbed together. And then like you, the rest is history. Initially, the Supreme Court sends us back to the High Court. Okay, the High Court gives that notorious judgment of Justice B.J. Setna, which uh, not only uh, upholds the acquittals, but calls Mihid Desai and me anti-national, <laughs> simply for recording Zaira Sheikh's affidavit. We come in appeal to that the Supreme Court and then we get that historic judgment on 12th of April 2004 which which is I think for me the first judicial acknowledgement of the horrors of communal violence by the Supreme Court ever because it actually talks about what communal violence does to a society it talks about witness protection it talks about all of that and then the trial starts in Bombay and then she turns hostile for a second time. And I, I just want to connect this hostility to a larger issue because when you enter Gujarat, you enter court, you face hostility, that is personal hostility by the VHP Carter, the Bajrang Dal Carter. But at some point this hostility becomes institutionalized. The state of Gujarat itself is doing this and this is seen in turning of witnesses, a personal campaign against you. Uh, how does that happen? Where does it start and how, what is the extent over the years as it grows? You know, I think it's because we stayed on. If we had, for instance, done the Best Bakery case and then dropped the other cases, then I think it wouldn't have been bad. Because I remember till 2003, 2004, I was going to the collector's office. I was going to the chief secretary's office as a petitioner in the compensation case. We were comparing notes. What does the collector's report say about how much compensation is be given? You know, the usual thing that governments do with NGOs, you know, that we can talk. But I think the moment the Best Bakery transfer happened, I think that was a huge, huge... Uh, for them a huge question of the whole, because it was a scathing comment on, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but 
Chief Justice Khare summoned BJP Chakravarti and Chief Secretary Lahiri to the Supreme Court and asked them how come a witness turned hostile on your watch. Now that's not really happened before that the Supreme Court is so proactive. So I think the Best Baker case was one of those benchmark cases that after that transfer happened out of Gujarat, the real hostility began. You know? That was the first false FIR against me, which Zaira was made, you know, after, after her statements, one BHP man filed the FIR about tutoring of witnesses, etc. First time I had to seek anticipatory bail, now I had to seek it nine times. And uh, because you just allude to it, could you just sort of describe in detail how the government intervenes, takes Zahira to a protected place and there's a week in which mm -hmm. she's actually in their custody? Completely. And it's this Amit Shah, who by then is Home Minister, you know, who's today kind of ruling over the country in this Gunda style. There's this Silver Oak guest house. Okay, silver oak, and this is part of the court record in the Zaira Sheikh case in the trial. So, November 2003, when the trial starts again, uh, her, her testimony is supposed to take place on 4th of November. On 3rd of November, she is whisked away to Baroda, given um, commando protection, and she gives that statement you know, that Tista kidnapped me, and under duress, I made those remarks, etc. And then that whole campaign begins. Uh, by 10th of uh, November, I approach Supreme Court and, and request a kind of invest, in, impartial inquiry into who's telling the truth business. In that period between, uh, between uh, uh, November and uh, I think her testimony in the Zaira Sheikh in the trial takes place in March, April next year. There's a whole 10 day period when she's in uh, Gandhinagar. Between the Gujarat High Court and beyond, there's a Silver Oak guest house. And this information I got from reliable police sources, like a journalist, where she is kept. She and her brother, Nafitullah, who thereafter dies under suspicious circumstances, they're kept there. And for 10 days, the entire staff of that guest house is dismissed. Only person with access to her and her brother are Amit Shah and his coterie. There's no staff allowed also in case somebody leaks the story or whatever. This is all part of the record in the Zahira Sheikh trial when she was examined for one hour by Manjula Rao as prosecutor. So what happened there? What was the deal that was struck? Was she intimidated further? Because there is no sign of Zahira Sheikh yet. I mean, we don't know. After She, she served one year sentence after the 2006 uh, verdict of the Supreme Court who convicted her for perjury, something in her made her go to the court and actually serve her sentence. So she has paid for it. But the person who turned her hostile, Madhu Shivastha, has not paid for even a day's jail in his life. So this is the kind of imbalance in the system, you know. And uh, these are the little bits of the story that have not been investigated further. Because we tried to persuade the court when they passed the perjury uh, uh, judgment against her that the 18 lakh rupees that were deposited, even the person giving it should be investigated. But unfortunately, that is not part of the judicial order. So the strange thing is that through this, as you said, the media uh, also from 2004 to 2014, we actually have a Congress government in power at the center. Yet, there seems to be almost a determined lack of effort or rather almost an attempt to subvert the process. You know, uh, one has to give a nuanced answer because in the last two and a half years, one sees the difference between what a Modi government is and a Congress government is. So one can't be naive about saying there's no difference at all. There's a big difference. But our problem was that in the cases that were pending in the Supreme Court, where a simple affidavit had to be filed by the Home Department, that yes, the demand of the petitioners for a CBI inquiry Central government has no objection to it. And this petition has been filed by CJP in 2002. Okay, UPA1 comes to power in 2004. But SIT is appointed in 2008. Now, every other month, I'll look, my lawyers are here, they'll tell you how painfully we would mention this every time in the Supreme Court. At one point in the court, there was a situation by one court officer of the government saying, yes, it can be given to CBI, and another one saying, no, CBI has too much work. So, you know, the point is that because you didn't have a clear, unequivocal stand by the UPA1 government, you actually allowed so much time to lapse, and moment time lapses, judicial memory also becomes cynical, and even the judiciary wants to sort of push it away. Till 2007, 
If you look at Amicus Curie, Mr. Harish Salde's report to the Supreme Court, it is scathing. He says that every single one of Mr. Shikumar's affidavits should be part of the evidence. He says the phone call records of Mr. Rahul Sharma, the CD, should be examined by the court. But suddenly after that, there's fatigue, there's compromise, there's whatever. And the 2008 SIT is a much more lackluster uh, option than a rigorous investigation that would have occurred maybe in 2004 or 5 or 6 when everything was still fresh, evidence was available, etc. So you see this drop off in interest, but it's a little more than that. You mentioned Harish Salve. Uh, his enthusiasm again does not seem to have continued in the same measure later. I don't want to get into individual, but there's a clear difference over a period of time. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole thing sort of peters off. So then it, then it becomes that only CJP and our band, brave band of lawyers, and we are carrying on despite that. And then you become even greater a target. Uh, and you know, somewhere I got the feeling, and it's not a, it's not a very happy feeling, but uh, we keep on saying these 172 convictions. 126 life imprisonments, that's our achievement, the glass half full. We never ask for death penalty because we don't believe in retributive justice. But, you know, why did 1984 not get convictions? Why did 92, 93 not get convictions? So there is a certain across the party impunity. And I can never forget something that haunted me because I think Sh Shri and I drew up that list together. That after 2002, when you had the UPA government coming in 2004, I've listed the names there. Many of the top officials who were close to the coterie were brought to the center. I mean, I don't understand this. It's, is it the force protecting itself? Is there a political across the party in, in unity operating here? Is the, are there deals being struck? I don't know. But it's very frustrating when you're trying to actually forge, you know, something new in terms of jurisprudence for the victims and survivors of mass crimes that it's then the whole secular, non-secular label starts getting blurred. Because the same IAS, IPS officers close to the Modi coterie are finding plump, plump posts in the center under UPA 1 and UPA 2. And the ones who have actually acted during the riots continue to suffer. But Each one of them. I mean, this needs to be said that 14 districts were really bad where the violence took place, including Bhavnagar, where Rahul Sharma defied orders no, to allow violence, risked his life and protected lives. But all the other 11 districts where there was not much violence, we need to record there were SPs who went against the political uh, dicta and each one of them was punished. Those who, guys gave, those who gave security to Justice Krishnayar and Justice Savant who were part of the tribunal, Samyula and Sari and all, were particularly punished. I mean, you, I've never seen such a petty and vindictive administration but now you can understand how it is in Delhi today. <laughs> and uh, I mean, most of these decisions fall under the purview of a man named Mr. Shivraj Patil, whose ideological inclinations, as journalists, we seem to think were far closer to the RSS than the Congress itself. Yeah. But I, I didn't say that. <laughs> and yeah, leave no, it. no, 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 it's true. You are the whole Hussein campaign. You, you could not have the artist come back to his own country. I mean, it, it is, I mean, certain, the problem is this, this merging and this blurring of the distinction between what is secular and what is not secular is what is, is, has created the problem in the political arena, you know. And I still believe that between 2004 and 2006, 7, if there had been certain very categoric actions to support what we were doing and what survivors were trying to do judicially, things could have been different. So there are these crucial moments, even when the SIT is set up, there could have been, let, let's put it mildly, a better choice of officers. What did you make of the choice no, of Raghavan? No, we've, we've said that, we've said you that said on record. That right. No, on record of the Supreme Court. On 26th of March 2008, when the Supreme Court said that we'll appoint so-and-so as a thing, we said we are the petitioners, we represent the survivors, and we would like at least these three or four officers from the Gujarat cadre to be there. And, and, the, and the court, High Court has given it in other cases like Ishrat and all. But in our case, and by then Mr. Salve was talking to Mr. Rodgi and they had a deal. I don't know what, but all the officers that were appointed were appointed were a deal between the Gujarat government and Mr. Salve. None of our names were considered. I can I mean, mention the names. And these are all mainstream officers from the Gujarat cadres who could have assisted Raghavan, but who had an independent reputation. There was Rajneesh Rai we recommended. There were many people we recommended in that list, Vinod Mal, but they were not taken up. 
So there I started feeling that, you know, everybody from the system, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the amicus, everybody is kind of now trying to push off this petition and trying to dilute the SIT itself. So, I mean, let me just ask you the straight question. Even without a law of command responsibility, do you believe there is enough evidence to lead us directly to Mr. Narendra Modi? A uh, bit of the indicators in this book, and I've persuaded my publishers to have part two to this. They've agreed. And I think that will point it out when I try to say that uh, the, the evidence we galvanized in the Zakia Jafri case, if you read it very, very carefully, and it's not just about the 27 February meeting. You know, that's because the 27 February meeting, dramatic, etc., is important. But the build up before 27, there was a whole build up to Gujarat before 27 February, which is again. We have indicators from the State Intelligence Bureau reports, etc. We have police control. What does, I think there is enough evidence to prosecute the Chief Minister. I don't know if there's enough evidence to convict him. But to derail the possibility of a prosecution is to actually deny that that evidence exists. And for me, it's a test for the courts of this country. It's a real test for the courts of this country that whether they can stomach this evidence and digest it. It's there before them. Despite the attacks on us, uh, 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 like I said, you, the Supreme Court was faced with a dilemma. The SIT appointed by it said there's not enough evidence to prosecute. But the amicus curiae, Mr. Raju Ramachandran, I was hoping he's coming to uh, it is appoint, uh, uh, the, Mr. Raju Ramachandran clearly said that there's evidence to prosecute the Chief Minister. So the Supreme Court was faced with this dilemma. The Supreme Court sends us back to the lowest rung, which is the magistrate, saying, go there, uh, exercise your rights, file a protest petition. It takes us one year to access the, the, the investigation papers. Supreme Court says you have, we, we have a right to them, but the SIT harasses us so much that we have to come back in a separate SLP to get the papers. Then we get 24,000 pages in February 2013. In two months, we go through those and file a petition which is about 1,000 pages. That is argued till September. In December 2013, it's rejected by only one court the lowest court. We've challenged it in the High Court. It's the SIT that has delayed the hearing. Now the hearing has begun and the next hearing is on 31st March. So it's not a closed chapter yet. And my, my conviction is that I don't know whether the courts have the stomach to actually grant the fact that it can be a prosecution, but I believe there's enough evidence. As you go along at each step, of course there's institutional, there is government, but when you take officers like Raghwan, you take individual people, it seems largely also to come back to the fact that there's a complicit belief that's almost majoritarian which goes beyond just arm twisting. There is complicity out of sympathy for almost what has happened in 2002. Yeah, that uh, or there's a belief that you don't take this further, that what you've got is enough and don't go beyond that, don't go into culpability, administrative or criminal of IAS officers or police officers because that disturbs the morale of the force. Don't get into trying to question the command responsibility of the politician because it's happened before, it'll happen again. The point is that, that's what the, by the way, the experiment to the entire movement to get the criminal violence bill, the prevention of criminal violence bill, which you know needs to be said, that whole bill, that entire impetus came and you know again the UPA1 government under the common minimum program thanks to the Concerned Citizens' Tribunal Report, promised this country that it will give us a prevention of communal violence bill. And again, I believe many of us work towards it. We uh, lobbied for it. We addressed meetings for it. And I think we became greater enemies of everybody concerned in the political class uh, and possibly even bureaucrats and policemen because I think the greatest resistance was from there. That, you know, if you have in a law enacted that if, if under my watch, and you know my reference to kutte ke bache because of, you know kutte ke bache is not pillars. Pillars is different when you say pillars and you say kutte ke bache. You know? that, that, then you are responsible. You have to be responsible for that activity. And that takes me back to a Vibhuti Narayan Rai interview I did uh, in 93. An officer who's really studied this entire thing deeply when he said no communal riots can continue for 24 hours unless the state wants it to. So if you hold the SP responsible, if you hold the collector responsible, the DM responsible, kabhi to band hoga na, nahi to band nahi hoga. In 
all these cases today where do you see still open possibilities of taking it forward what remains outstanding what are the cases you are still pursuing which is where something can still come out the zakia jaffi case <laughs> Uh, the Zakia Jaffe case is in the High Court. Uh, we have argued it very vigorously. We filed written arguments. Uh, 31st uh, March is the next hearing. Then SIT will reply to us. Uh, I'd like to state here, which I said in the book also, that SIT has become completely hostile to the survivor. And SIT is appointed because of a survivor petition in the Supreme Court, okay, to transfer investigation out of Gujarat. And that SIT is today the most hostile towards the survivor. You know how much the SIT lawyers are paid? I have to say this. One hearing in the High Court, 9 lakh rupees a day. I have the RTI, so I mean, they can take me to court. And the SIT officers? I don't know. SIT officers, 1.5 lakhs a month for the last, since 2008. And my point is, what are our lawyers paid? Nothing. I mean, we, we, with great difficulty, we give them an air ticket and we put them up at either the sports club or, or uh, at a little hotel. No fees ever charged by any of our council. And that, that's why a huge tribute to that team. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> and, you know, this, I mean, how do, you, how do you tackle this level of imbalance? Uh, this SIT is appointed by the Supreme Court. SIT is paid, and who pays us nine lakhs? Gujarat government. Isn't there a kind of conflict of interest here? And again, this is something, as you've reminded, goes back over and over again, the selection of prosecution, the tutoring of lawyers, witnesses, etc., whether of bureaucrats, as Mr. Sri Kumar has documented, Subara, or yeah. tutor. At each step, the government and the VHP are actually involved in the process of derailment. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, the, uh, in the same Best Bakery judgment that I called historic, uh, one of the things that the judgment talks about is the public prosecutor behaving like defense counsel. Because every single PP who is appointed for the sensitive cases are RSS men or VHP men. Which is almost one and the same thing, but just more ribald than the other maybe, but they're the same thing. So, a Supreme Court comes down on them, so they can't appoint a prosecutor who is overtly RSS. Obvious. So, what do they do next? What they do is, the accused lawyers, I mean, the level of subversion that Modi has achieved is infinite. He's really monitored it to a T. All the uh, lawyers who appear for the Gulberg accused, the Naruda Patia accused, the Sardarpura accused, appear for them here, the accused, whom we are contesting. And in all the bomb blast trials on other trials, they are given special rates and appointed as state government lawyers at 40,000 rupees a day, 50,000 a day, and all that, so that they get they benefit from the state exchequer that way. So, you know, then you take this to the bar council. I took it to one of my friends there. But they said, so what? I mean, he's a lawyer. He can do it. So, there's nothing in the framework that actually sees that as conflict of interest. But the state has that manner at a different level. In fact, NDTV India did a story on this, saying, isn't this another kind of subversion? But the, the system doesn't think so. So, then again, how do you deal with that? Then the people, the person who kind of is used to launch an attack on me, I mean, a former employee. Rice Khan. Right. He, his lawyer is today a, a chief prosecutor, the lawyer who appears for him, and she might be a judge tomorrow. You know, so I mean, this levels and levels of subversion is, uh, is, is something which is really very, very scary because how far can a victim go? How far can a survivor go? How, can, how far can a civil rights group go to contest? And I believe that, you know, because of a certain obsession, passion that one has continued, Credibility one has, the lawyers believe in your integrity. I mean, one of the greatest compliments I received was a small Facebook message that Aparna put out a few months ago when all this one more controversy was raving about me and some nastiness and all that. So she said, in the 14 years I've known her, not once has she asked me to do anything which is illegal or out of the law. And that's why it's a privilege to be her lawyer. Now you have this kind of, they believe in your integrity, they know you've done nothing wrong, so they stand up for you. But it's a very imbalanced battle. When you have the entire state, money, state power being used at one level and uh, si simply conviction and a band of good people at the other, you know. And I'm just hurrying through because I want to throw yeah. the questions. But there is still an important section left. This government comes to power. 
and suddenly your credit card bills are also public yeah. report. And whether I drink a glass of wine on my personal right. account or whether I do my hair in a saloon or not, which I do, uh, is, is uh, suddenly up for grabs, you know. And what I'm saying is, we are, I have a credit card and I only charge my trust for those things that are sanctioned by the trust. The Gujarat police has 25,000 pages of our vouchers to prove it. There's no charge sheet after three and a half years. And the same society that cannot ask Modi a question about when you see Adani on the plane that transports your chief, your, your prime minister. I mean, I find it appalling. He's going for an election campaign and the, and the plane is Adani's. Or his personal expenses during Navratri, 9 crore rupees for bisleri water bills. Or how much he spends on foreign travels is not being disclosed for national security reasons. And then you have on the other side this kind of pettiness. You know? So the effort is simply to vilify you in the public domain. And I just like to say from this forum that they've found nothing against us. So they'll just continue with this vilification uh, in the hope that the vilification and the rumor mongering works. And I just want to ask you because this kind of vilification is particularly pernicious. The first time all of us read it, yeah. we, we stop for a moment and start wondering what is going on in terms of spending on the trust because to pair through those documents is not easy. It's not easy and I think journalists have become very lazy. <laughs> so for instance, uh, a name I will not mention but from, a, from India's number one paper, Times of India, will keep regurgitating what the Gujarat police says in four columns and I think everybody knows the name. But our rejoinder affidavit, which is succinct, I mean, which is huge, 100 pages, but we, to which we give a succinct three-page summary, will not be published or not even be read by that reporter till we then contact the editor and four days later there'll be a rejoinder. So I think it's not just about this, it, I think it's about the fact that the media becoming a little lazy. And like my friend John Dayal said, that when the government in power gets a one-hour news program against the star, it's not an expose, it's a plant. And the journalist should see it as a plant, not as an expose. Thank you, Tista. I think we will end it there. Thank you.